2021. We are glad you are here today. It was a beautiful walk across the church property to come in today. A lot of squirrels out there. Squirrels are busy this time of year. And I tried to count them last week, and it's just, they move too fast for me to count. But uh, we are glad you are here today. We do hope that you'll take time to review the announcements that are in the bulletin. And I uh, just want to give you a heads up that the next uh, Saturday evening is when we turn our clocks back. And uh, so there was, a, in my first pastorate, senior pastorate in Cleveland, Oklahoma, there was one individual who was a male. He was old. So that's, that's just, I don't know why I said that, but he was. <laughs> but uh, clarifying. For, yeah, just clarify. For some reason, he just didn't like to hear preaching. And uh, he was always there for Sunday school, except for the time change, which brought him to Sunday school one hour late. And he walked in, and I said, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but again, that next, if you want to stay up till 2 o'clock Sunday morning to change it, God bless you. But uh, we just want to give you a heads up with that information. And... Uh, I just want to give you an update on where we are as far as our journey with the big C cancer. And uh, I am finally scheduled for radiation starting November 10th. And uh, so we will be talking with the board uh, this coming Thursday, a little bit of update of where we are. And we are going to suggest to them what would be helpful to us as far as a schedule. And uh, so, but uh, that's where we are. And I'm in the office all this week. So if you have, have something urgent that you want to talk to me about, this is the week to find me, okay? But uh, we, again, Charlene and I, I, it's, I feel like I'm repetitious, but it's really how we feel. Your support prayerfully and just generos generously with your generosity has been fantastic. And uh, I learned something about the medical field. When they said treatments will last five and a half weeks, they don't tell you that it takes five and a half weeks to get ready for the treatments. Okay, so we finally arrived to that point. And again, I just want to let you know that's where we are. And uh, we will keep you updated as we know some more information. At this time, I think Ruth has something. open those and then we've got others here that we're going to get to take home and this container
the oxygen that they will do a blood serum is being stored now and that cellular to cell that she struggles to breathe at times, even at times that she struggles. Anyway, we're dealing with it and uh, she's got a weakened immune system, so that's why she likes pants. She likes if she likes she likes to go to the That straightened out. My first mistake of the day. <laughs> I could just see us. I could just see us opening cars at the parsley this afternoon, and it says, "Your years of service here have been appreciated." <laughs> no, not really. I mean, so thank you again. Thank you very much. Our call to worship this morning is from John chapter one, but it brings a conclusion. This whole service is going to bring. To a conclusion to what we've been looking at in Romans chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8. And uh, the theme of today's worship celebration is God's amazing grace. And what we have learned by studying portions of the book of Romans together is this. God so loved the world that he entered into our messes. Sin makes a mess of everything. And as John is opening up his gospel, he reminds us of that truth. In John chapter 1, verse 14, he says this. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. God put on human, human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. And he not only came, but he dwelt among us. The original terms could be translated. He set up his tent with us. He made his home with us. And because God did that, because God through Jesus Christ 
was willing to enter into our mess, we have seen the glory of God, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, and that Christ reminds us of the fullness of God's grace and the fullness of God's truth. And so today, we're going to celebrate God's amazing grace. We will close this hour together by observing the Lord's Supper together. But could we, just for 45 minutes or so, could we focus not on the mess, but could we focus on God's amazing grace and the fact that he is willing to be involved in our messes. Father, thank you for this truth that we've been looking at for several weeks. And now as we worship together, we pray that you would bring even a deeper realization into our minds and into our hearts of how good you truly are. And may we truly rejoice and be thankful for your purpose and your plan that is experienced through Jesus Christ. It's in Christ's name we pray. And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. on the scripture today, we are going to continue to develop that theme that God enters into our messes. In the first two chapters of Genesis, we discover that God creates a perfect world. He creates perfect humanity. <coughs> but in Genesis chapter 3, sin enters the world. And when sin enters the world, as you get your way to the end of chapter 3 and you work your way all the way through Genesis 4 through 11, you come to this question. Well, what's God going to do with this problem? It seems as if there's no hope because sin 
is in the world and sin is in the hearts of the people that he has created. And the rest of the Old Testament can be summed up in the fact of four specific covenants where God enters into humanity and says, this is how I'm going to fix the mess of sin. And the first of those covenants is found with the call of Abraham. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles and just read with me, notice what God does. Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel, everything's a mess, people are scattered, it looks like sin wins. God says, wait a minute. Grace wins every time. Every time. Every time. And he says, the Lord had said to Abram, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, here's what I want you to do. Go from your country, go from your people, and go from your father's household to the land I will show you. Notice, I want you to go. I want you to leave everything that's familiar and go to the place that I will show you. He didn't give a AAA directory. <laughs> By faith, he had to trust that God would take him to where he wanted him to be. And then here's the promise. If you will do this, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make, make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. I'm going to do something that's going to affect not only your family, but it's going to affect all the nations of the world. You are going to be a blessing. In fact, every person, every people group on earth will be blessed through you. Wow. Then, verse 4, so Abram went as the Lord had told him. Notice, God wants to enter into our messes, and in this first covenant, he speaks to a man named Abram, who later is given the name Abraham, which is, means the father of many nations, and by faith, Abram trusted God. And we want to sing one of the great hymns of the church. It's the hymn, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Let's sing it together. Just to pay. 
Amen. What a tremendous testimony we've just made together. Oh, for grace to trust him more. That fourth verse is my favorite of that great hymn. It says, I'm so glad I've learned. I'm so glad I'm learning. so glad I'm learning to trust Thank him. You. Oh, for grace to trust him more. Maybe you're like me and you discovered that the trust of last week may not carry me through the trust of this week. And that's what Abraham experienced. We don't have time to look at how even though God had given him the promises, Abraham <laughs> took matters into his own, own hands more than once. And so we come to a second covenant it is, opens for us in Exodus chapter 19. You get to the close of the book of, of Genesis, and you've got this uh, situation like, well, this covenant sure didn't seem to work. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> it's not because God's not faithful. It's because of humanity. And so uh, what's the next invasion into the mess? It's the Mosaic covenant. And if you would, follow along as I read verses 1 through 6 of, of Exodus 19. And if you turn to Exodus 19, you'll probably say, oh yeah, that's right before chapter 20, which is the Ten Commandments, which we stand upon. But there's an important prelude and introduction to the Ten Commandments. Here's what part of it says. On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mount and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. Verse 4, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagle's wings, and brought you out to myself. Notice the Mosaic Covenant. The basis is, I'm a God who redeemed you. I'm a God who delivered you. I'm a God who saved you from what you were experiencing in Egypt. Verse 5. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then... Out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Sounds like what he said to Abram. Although the whole earth is mine, you are my special people. And notice, what makes you special is not only the fact that I have redeemed you, but I want to make you a kingdom of priests. 
I want to make you a holy nation. These are the words that you are to speak to the Israelites. See, God had a purpose. God had a plan. He told Abram, I'm going to bless all the world through you. In the Mosaic Covenant, I have redeemed you. I've brought you out. And you are my special people. And we like to be special people. And you will be a kingdom of priests. In other words, I am going to take you. I'm going to make you a holy nation. And you are going to shine for me throughout the world. So we want to sing one verse. I love to sing all four verses because each verse is better. But we're just going to sing one verse of this great prayer, which says, shine, Jesus shine because we are a kingdom of priests. See how that song speaks? Oh, we got pause there. You see how that song speaks of what God's plan is in the Mosaic Covenant? We are going to shine not for our glory, but for the glory of the Lord. Not for our puny little kingdom, but for his great eternal kingdom, which brings us to the third covenant. If you would, turn to 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7. We're not going to read all this chapter, even though I require my Old Testament students to read it all and write a paper on it. I'm not going to ask you to do that. But I want us to understand that here's the scene. David has conquered many lands. He has built for himself a glorious, majestic house. And as he looks at his house, he realizes that God still lives in a little box. Now, it's a significant box. It's the Ark of the Covenant. And he wants to build a majestic house for God to live in. But through the prophet Nathan, God speaks to David. No, 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 wait a minute. In fact, listen to what he says. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse Number 11. I can't find verse 11. Somebody stole it out of my Bible. Yeah, it's in the middle. Let's go to verse 8 so that I can get a context. Look at verse 8. Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from the tending of the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. Notice, I took you out. 
I said, I keep, that theme keeps coming up. I took you out of something. We pick it up then. I have been with you wherever you have gone. Sounds like the covenant from me with Abraham. I have cut off of all your enemies before you. Now, I will make your name great like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel. And I will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning, verse 11, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. Now notice, God's going to speak here. David said, I want to build you a house, Lord. Notice what God says. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself is going to establish a house for you. Do you hear the shift? I want to build you a big, great house, God. God says, no. I'm going to build a house for you. And notice, when your days are over, verse 12, and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood. I will establish his kingdom. He's the only one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Guess who he's talking about? Jesus. I will be his father, and he will be my son. Verse number 16. Your house and your kingdom, this house, this kingdom that I am building will endure forever. And your throne will be established forever. I thought you'd get up and run the aisles. <laughs> That's okay. My students don't either. But notice, God says, I am going to enter into your mess. I am going to deal with this sin issue. And the way that I'm going to do it, I'm not for, it's not going to be because you're going to build a great kingdom for me. You're not going to build a great house for me to live in. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to build a kingdom for out of you. I'm going to build something for you. I'm going to build something, a kingdom forever through you. And it will never come to an end. Wow. Kingdom. Forever. Eternal. Jesus picks up on that kingdom theme all through the book of Matthew. In fact, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, you know what he says? If you seek first the kingdom of heaven, all the other things will be taken care of. Jesus says, when we seek first this kingdom that was promised through to and through David, we have an assurance that all those other things will be taken care of. That speaks to us. We come together today and we've been reflecting on God's amazing grace and the fact that he does enter into our messes. But the truth is, because of our messes, we have concerns and we have prayers. So today, let's sing through this course. Let's make it a prayer course. We not only celebrate the reality of God's promise of the covenant given to David, but we also remind ourselves that when we seek first that eternal kingdom, all the other things of life, will be taken care of. Let's sing it together.
Father, we just prayed a tremendous prayer. We looked at the Davidic covenant, that the great promise that you gave to David. David wanted to do something great to honor you. God said, let me make your name great. I'm going to do something that you'll never, you'll never, you never dreamed of. I'm going to build a kingdom for you and through you. It'll be a forever kingdom. Implication being that it's not just built on human bloodlines, but it's built on a supernatural bloodline. It's generation after generation. It's a kingdom, a kingdom of priests that are bound together, not necessarily by human bloodline, but because of God's amazing grace, the bloodline of Jesus Christ. And so as we are here today, Lord, we, we pause in the midst of our celebration and our thinking of the Old Testament that points to the New Testament. And we do just pray that in our hearts, the kingdom of God and your righteousness would be first. It's so easy to be distracted and derailed. But Lord, today we focus on your kingdom. We focus on the King of Jesus Christ, who is the author and the perfecter and the finisher of our faith. Our faith begins and ends with Jesus Christ. And so we just take time to seek him, to make him the number one priority in our lives. And Lord, we do pray for those things that need to be added into our lives. Lord, may we pursue you more than the blessings. May we have the courage to ask. May we have the grace to seek. And Lord, may we have the courage to knock. And Lord, I pray that we would realize that when we ask and we seek and knock, that there is a depth to that series of requests. It's not just giving the Christmas list. It's not just giving you our list. It's seeking you. It's realizing that though we want to do see something great happen in our life, that what really brings a blessing and what fulfills your purpose is that you would make us a part of the eternal and everlasting kingdom of God. And Lord, the last two words in each of the verses that we sang of this prayer course it says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So Lord, we we come full circle in our prayer time. We, we thank you for hearing our requests. And we thank you for hearing our prayers. But Lord, we also thank you that no matter what might change or what might stay the same, we can say, thanks be to God. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As we sing through this chorus one more time each verse, may we continue to surrender our puny little kingdoms to his great eternal kingdom. Let's sing it one more time. seated. Take your Bibles again. And let's go further into the Old Testament. We will land at the book of Jeremiah chapter 31, which connects us to the New Testament, which connects us to the elements of the Lord's Supper that are before us. We now move to the brand new covenant. 
Notice what God says. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. It's great to hear those pages turn. It really is. The days are coming. Notice the future aspect of these words. When I will make a, will you say it with me? A new covenant. Woohoo! With the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. Please keep in mind, at this particular point in history, Judah and Israel are two separate nations. In fact, Israel has disappeared. God's going to restore and unite those two nations that have been divided. Verse 32. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors, like that covenant when I took them by the hand to lead them out of, my, out of Egypt. You know why? Because they broke my covenant. I was faithful, but they had a heart problem, and they couldn't carry through with their responsibilities. Even though I was a husband, a faithful husband to them, declares the Lord. Verse 33 this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time the Lord declares. And notice the inward working. See, all through this, from Genesis 3 forward, God was faithful, but there was sin in the heart of humanity. And the sin issue, the sin problem had to be dealt with. It's an internal thing. So what does God say? I'm going to put their law, not on stone tablets, but... In their minds. I'm going to write it. Not on stone tablets. I'm going to write it on their hearts. I will be their God. And they will be my people. Verse 34. No longer will they teach their neighbor. Or say to one another. Know the Lord. You're not going to hand out gospel tracts everywhere you go. Why? Because everyone will know me. From the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord. In other words, it's not gospel track stuff. I've written the law on your mind and on your heart. It's inside of you, and it just kind of bubbles out. People see something different. Oh, and by the way, I will forgive their wickedness, and I remember their sins no more. Like the people of old, like the people of Abraham, they like that part. We're going to make you a blessing. I'm going to make you a great nation. They forget the fact that we're going to bless all the nations through you. And in the New Testament there, we like to go down to, I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Yes! But also, because of that new covenant, because I do something on the inside of you, you are going to shine for Jesus. You are going to shine just like that song sound said. You're going to blaze. Why? Because of the new covenant. Because of the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. And my friends, not only did he die on the cross, but the cross is empty. His crown of thorns is still there. But he's not there because he is alive and well. He is the resurrected Savior. Amen. What I love about this next song that we're going to sing, it takes a great hymn of the church, puts it to a little different rhythm that might make us feel a little uneasy, but it's going to talk about the, the great cross of Jesus Christ, and then the chorus is going to say, oh, may we come to that cross, and may we be willing to die just as Christ died for us. Amen. Let's stand together, could we, as we sing the great hymn of the church in a more contemporary manner.
Jesus invites us to come. He invites us first to come and die so that we may truly live. See, we're not really ready to live until we're ready to die. And we've come to this point of our week or our weeks of celebrating God's amazing grace. And the best way to remind ourselves of God's amazing grace is to partake together in the Lord's Supper. If you'd like to be seated, I would like to give you some instructions of how we're going to do this. It's a repetition of the way that we did it a couple of months ago, but uh, I had to check with the stewards to remind me how we did. So you'll probably need reminded also. In just a few moments, the stewards are going to come forward, and they are going to assist us in receiving the elements. We are still very sensitive to the social distancing matters. And so we are going to have you come. We are going to have you come row by row. Cameron's back there, and he will start at the back, and he will dismiss you row by row by simply giving you a nod. Those on my left, your right, if you will get up and come down this aisle and come across, there are cups with some grape juice here. Then there will also be stewards here to present to you the unleavened bread. What we ask you to do is simply extend your hand. You receive it so that we can keep the handling of 
the pieces of unleavened bread minimal. Those of you on my right and your left, you will stand and then you'll come down here and come across and take your cup here from uh, the cups that are here on the altar. Then take your piece of unleavened bread. If you return to your seat and take a seat and just reverently wait, I will lead us in taking the Lord's Supper together. Now, please we might be reminded of what we just sang. All who gather here, anyone who gathers here, by grace can draw near. Today you may say, well, I'm not really certain of my walk with Christ. I came to church today, and I'm glad I did. But you know what? This Lord's Supper is not just for those of us who are in the family. For those of us who are on the outside looking in still, it can be a day of God's amazing grace in your life. Please understand that when you take the, the cup and then you take the unleavened bread, there's nothing that brings salvation in the elements. What does bring new life in Christ is when you take your faith and combine them with the elements, then you experience God's amazing grace. You are, every single one of us is invited. As we come, may we be mindful of the fact that Jesus paid it all. May we be reminded of the fact that all four of the Old Testament covenants anticipated what God was going to do through the person of Jesus Christ. And as the Old Testament people look back, we as the New Testament people, excuse me, Old Testament people look forward, we as the New Testament people, we look back and we rejoice and we celebrate and we find hope in the cross, in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of the family of God. And Lord, now as we very reverently receive the elements, our prayer is that uh, we be mindful of your son, Jesus Christ. May we be grateful for his sacrificial spilling of his blood. May we be generous in our praise because of the fact that his body was broken and bruised on our behalf. And Lord, as we receive the elements, may our faith also be enacted. And may we receive these elements. And by faith, they become not just something we do at church, but they symbolize the amazing work of God in our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen and amen. Starting from the back of each side, if you would just come forward, the ladies will assist you in serving you.
of these next 30 seconds. Once you get your cup placed to a place where you feel comfortable that they won't make a mess, when you can just give your attention fully to Christ, would you just take 30 seconds and if you're like me, you need to close your eyes because you get easily distracted. And would you just in your own heart and in your own mind reflect on God's amazing would you reflect on the fact that God has willingly become involved in the mess of your life? And would you also rejoice in the fact that we anticipate drinking from the fourth cup, which is the mighty messianic arrival of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords in all his glory? Just take 30 seconds. Reflect on God's amazing grace, what he has done, what he's doing, and what he will do. God. 
God say? Amen. 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 We're going to do something a little different today. So what's new with this guy? <laughs> You'll notice that on the communion table, we not only have the elements of the Lord's Supper, but every spring and fall, the Church of the Nazarene takes a love offering. Now the key there is love offering. This is an additional offering to the one you put in the boxes in the back. Okay? Those are regular tithes and offerings. This is a love offering, one that's done sacrificially. It's given a little extra, or if you're comfortable, a lot extra. <laughs> and this offering will Every penny of it will go to Kansas City area, to the international headquarters of the Church of the Nazarene, and every penny of this special love offering will go for the building or purchase of properties, the development of properties all over the world. For those of us who went to listen to the missionary presentation earlier this month, I, I don't know if it was packed, I can't remember where it was. But the, the government there would not officially allow the Church of the Nazarene to be recognized as a legal sharer of, the way of, of a way of faith in their country until they put up a church building. Oh, very important in that culture. And the missionary assured us that our, our alabaster offering this year will go so that several church buildings can be put up in Amen. this country so that the Nazarene Church can be officially recognized. So we're going to invite you to follow the same pattern. You're going to get up and go that way. We're not necessarily going to dismiss you by roads this time, but we are going to open up this box. It's a toolbox, and we've got a real big one because we want to fill it. And uh, we're going to pass by again to each side. And we encourage you to just give a special love offering for the cause of world mission all around the world. Amen. And we're going to make it a good march. You know, you see marches on TV all the time. They <laughs> march for this, they march for that. We're going to march for something today. It's a good old-fashioned alabaster march. And as we do it, we're going to sing together the song, The Days of Elijah, which talks about all the covenants that we have talked we have talked. And so we are going to end with another celebration. We have received God's amazing grace, symbolized in the Lord's Supper, and now we return a love offering back to him through the giving of an alabaster offering. So I'm going to drop in my money, and I'm going to go back here and hit my magic button. And uh, once the music starts, you feel free to make the march up here, and let's receive this love offering for world evangelists. Stand with me, would you? Shining like 
Amen. Go in his amazing grace.